Good morning, distinguished representatives and guests, and welcome to the second in a series of virtual webinars aimed at encouraging policy dialogue between Brazilian and Australian industry and government stakeholders on the topic of mineral governance and sustainable development. Uh, my name is Daniel Franks, and I'm a professor at the Sustain uh, Sustainable Minerals Institute at the University of Queensland in Australia. Uh, there, I'm the program lead of the Development Minerals Program, and I'll be facilitating this webinar today. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners and their custodianship on the lands in which I'm speaking today. And on behalf of the Sustainable Minerals Institute at the University of Queensland, I pay our respects to the Turubul and Jagara people, their ancestors and descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. And we recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. I'd also like to pass on an apology from Australia's ambassador to Brazil, His Excellency, Mr. Timothy Kane, who's unable to join the webinar this evening. Infelizmente, ele não vai poder se juntar a nós esta noite. Então, eu agradeço pelo tempo de estar conosco hoje e em nome dos meus colegas, eu dou boas-vindas a todos, bem como aos nossos palestrantes, palestrantes e painelistas. Management and reuse opportunities for tailings, a topic that is of considerable interest to governments, industry and communities globally, especially in Brazil and in Australia. And Over the course of the next one and a half hours, you'll hear from leading experts who provide insights into the challenges and opportunities associated with mine tailings and the ways in which they can be managed and reused in a sustainable manner. You'll also have a chance to ask questions of our experts um, and I'll indicate in a moment uh, how you can do that. The webinars have been organized by the Australian Embassy in Brazil and the Brazilian Ministry of Mines and Energy in partnership with the Sustainable Minerals Institute at the University of Queensland. Before I give the floor to our distinguished guests to provide a few opening remarks, please allow me to provide you with an overview of our webinar today. Uh, following the opening remarks, you'll hear from um, Dr. Anita Prabhakar Fox uh, from Sustainable Minerals Institute, who will give a presentation on the topic of today's webinar. We're then going to have a facilitated panel session involving four experts from government and industry in Brazil and Australia. And during this panel discussion, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions of our experts. Uh, in the bottom right hand corner of your screen, there is a Q&A function. Um, that's available to receive your questions at any time during the session today. So please uh, state your question concisely and clearly. And during our panel session, our panelists will try to answer as many of those questions as possible in written form during that session. Uh, please also note that this webinar is being recorded. Throughout the course of this webinar, audience microphones and video will be turned off to minify, minimize interference. Okay, that's the preliminaries out of the way. Uh, let me now hand over to our distinguished guests uh, to provide a few opening remarks. Uh, first, we'll have Uh, Ms. Lilia Sant Augustino, um, the Under Secretary for Geology, Mining and Mineral Transformation for the Ministry of Mines and Energy in Brazil. And following her, we'll have Professor Neville Plint, the Director of the Sustainable Minerals Institute. Lilia. É Lilia mesmo. Good afternoon. Um, uh, I'm very glad to be here and to be to participate of this, this meeting. Uh, I, I should speak in English, but uh, surely, surely my part this should be, uh, can, explain, can express better my ideas, okay? So uh, I, I apologize, but uh, I will, I will transfer for, for Portuguese language. Okay. Uh, well, I would like to Okay, so I've switched to my native language now. Initially, I would like to start greeting and saying hello to all guests, all speakers. Everybody who's going to be part of our discuss will be uh, in the discussion, addressing all the topics, and all other participants who have joined us. I would like to start saying how happy and excited I am 
with having these opportunities for this exchange, an exchange with experts, experts who've been working in the mining sector and who bring lots of ideas who help, that help us here. where there are no specific policies for the industries. So this conversation with experts help guide our activities so that we can properly move and drive activities in our industry. So I first and foremost would like to show uh, how thankful and happy I am for this F. I would like to thank SMI, the, the Australian Embassy in Brazil and those who have joined us. Now this topic, Tailings, mining tailings, in our point of view, is one of the main challenges that mining faces in the future. There are other challenges, but this particular one is a major one, especially in what pertains the, when we look at mining raw materials that we see in nature in low levels and their extraction and how their extraction generates high levels of volumes high volumes of reject of, of waste and our challenge in the mining industry is to look at this in a different way differently from what we have looked in the past in the previous century we have been very much centered in improving extraction means of whatever mineral that is of use and interest and storing uh, suitably whatever rejects, whatever waste. They can be mining or proceeding uh, rejects and waste. However, perspectives change. And as the mining matures and further exploration adv advances, these waste actually accumulates. That means we have, this is a twofold scenario. The one, that we the environmental impact and the second is they were moving a great amount of of rock materials so to speak and we should be thinking of better use to best to best avail and maximize the use of rejects and tailings now in order to have this maximization of tailings, we should know them. We need to know what they are, what are in them, what uh, what is what are they made of, what can be used and can be economically used, and also and also help with raw material supply that the whole world needs. And according to forecast, we will need that greatly so, and at higher intensity levels that we have seen so far. So I'd say we need to know what we have first and foremost. And that means to improve our processes and also have better recovery of that main um, mineral asset, but also to see what are the productive chains could they be applied into, could be part of, maybe because they have the, an interest kind of composition for some other use from the end, such as construction and other building uh, materials and similar applications. So this particular tentative outlook, so what the use them to maximize the use, to make the, to bring to get the best out of the mineral resources that we in the mining industry move. And even though I'm not a miner, I am part of the sector, part of the industry, I think this is the main challenge that we have. So the challenge is not to sit comfortably. The idea would be to bear in mind the environmental sustainability and the challenge is to use and to take as much as possible from these uh, tailings. So, I think the the Dr. Anita will present very eloquently, and she shall bring us, I believe, some ways, some and studies and data. What the best practices are. She will be able to show us what what, the, what is new. What what are discoveries? What productive chain? To what supply chain can this be used to? Those be used to. 
surely this is a first step. I'd say the steps that follow would involve also, I'd say, extraction technologies, perhaps productive supply chains development in local, re regionally speaking, or under excellent conditions, maybe internationally. Sure. But listen, I'm thinking the first step is that we have to pay attention as to the investigation, the research, as in what, to what end, to what use, what useful uh, application these tailings can be applied to. How can we reuse them? How can we create sub products to other uh, mining uh, supply chain and productive sector? We, as the public sector, as the government, we have mining and development plan ambitions that is part of this government administration ambition that is very much geared to development. And one of the items of our development and mining program is especially uh, about uh, matters that we will um, discuss today, as in the reuse, um, adding value um, to management and reuse opportunity for tailings. So the actual topic of the, the, especially to the management reuse, this is the main, this is the core of our discussion and we cannot neglect sustainability underpinning all this. And I mean, and I mean sustainability because we have a longer uh, productive chain, supply chain, and also sustainability uh, environmentally wise, as in we're being responsible towards the environment and the use that we make of our tailings. So I don't want to take up much more of your time. I thank you. I I am. I also thank everybody for joining. Thank everybody for speaking. I'm also welcoming questions. We have Paulo Minsky from Lago Research and Marco Barso Remedio from uh, Geological Brazil, Anita Fox. She is the leader of the group. She a Carol Stein que está trabalha em projetos de reabilitação recursos minerais da Tasmânia no departamento de Tasmânia in the sustainable growth and I should also mention and Dr. Anita our main speaker of the day Professor Merlilo from SMI so thank you very much for organizing this event and this opportunity I wish I hope everybody has a great event thank you so much I'd like to pass the floor back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. I'll now ask uh, Professor Neville Plint to make op opening remarks. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Neville Plint. I'm the director of the Sustainable Minerals Institute at the University of Queensland. Um, I too acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today and pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants. I'd like to start by thanking the Under Secretary for her opening remarks this morning. It is an honor to have you join us for this webinar. I would also like to welcome our distinguished panel, members from Australia and Brazil, and a warm welcome to the rest of you on this webinar this morning, um, the topic being management and reuse opportunities for tailings. I'd like to start with a few words about the Sustainable Minerals Institute and then a couple of general comments about the webinar series. So for those that don't know us, the Sustainable Minerals Institute is made up of six research centers, a center of excellence based in Chile, which represents the six research centers in Chile, and a technology transfer company, JK Tech. We have a strong record across the resources sector in topics of exploration, mining, mineral processing, workplace health and safety, mine rehabilitation, water and energy management, social responsibility and governance. A core feature of our work is that it is transdisciplinary, it's independent, impartial and rigorous. In addition to depth of expertise in each of the centers, 
The Institute has initiated three strategic fo focus programs on key issues facing the minerals industry. These are unlocking um, complex ore bodies, governance and leadership, and development minerals. Today's seminar is the second in a series of three webinars that aim to encourage policy dialogue between Brazil and Australian industry and government stakeholders on the topic of mineral governance and sustainable development. The webinar has been organized by the Development Minerals Program, um, and I'd like to thank Daniel and his team for putting together a, a series that we are incredibly proud of. And this has been done in collaboration with the Australian Embassy in Brazil and the Ministry of Mines and Energy in Brazil. Um, together, uh, players, as important players in the global mining industry, we have significant capacity to shape the future of sustainable minerals development, both at home and abroad. This includes shaping policy and dialogue around increasingly important issues, including the topic today. As one of the world's leading research institutes for mining, the Sustainable Minerals Institute has been at the forefront of efforts to respond to the challenges of the mining industry. We're committed to developing innovative knowledge-based solutions for the sector and shaping of ideas and research through forums like today's seminar. Um, SMI has provided support to industry and government for a long time, and this has been around the world as we try to navigate the sustainability challenges, not only of the mineral sector, but of the world in general. An example of this um, was an initiative set up on behalf of the Australian government with the Institute and the University of Western Australia, where we hosted the International Mining for Development Center, commonly known as IM4DC, an acronym I always struggle to remember. Um, the centerpiece, uh, this was a centerpiece of the Australians Mining for Development Initiative. Over the course of the initiative, which ran from 2011 to 2015, SMI contributed to delivery of 105 short courses and workshops, fellowships and collaborative research and institute capacity building projects. A total of 2,726 participants from 789 institutes in 65 countries participated in the IM4DC projects. Today's webinar is focused on the topic that is of increasing importance in Brazil and in many other countries around the world, the management and use of tailings and more generally efforts to promote circular economies in the mining sector. Mine tailings have been an issue of considerable interest in both Brazil and other countries and in Australia. The potential to reduce the environmental and social footprint of tailings is an exciting one and is a topic being pursued by a number of experts within the Sustainable Minerals Institute. I'm sure you'll find today's presentation by Anita and the panel discussion thereafter both engaging and illuminating. I look forward to the conversation and the questions and comments, and I hope you enjoy this webinar and join us for the next one, which will be the final webinar in the series. Thank you very much. Thank you, Neville. Uh, I'd now like to introduce our speaker for today's webinar, which is uh, Dr. Anita Pabaka Fox. Anita is a Senior Research Fellow in Geometallurgy and Applied Geochemistry at the WH Bryan Mining and Geology Research Centre within the Sustainable Minerals Institute. Anita's research is focused on mine waste characterization to improve mine planning and waste management practices. And she's worked with the mining industry, MET sector and government stakeholders. She's developed new tests and protocols for improving mine waste characterization and has also been involved in identifying remediation options for abandoned and historical mine sites. And most recently, Anita has led industry and government funded projects characterizing mine waste materials to evaluate their economic potential. I'll now hand over to our keynote speaker, Anita. Thank you. 
Good morning and uh, good afternoon. Thanks, Daniel. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm actually currently out um, undertaking some field sampling. So um, when I start the presentation, I will have to turn my camera off just to make sure that the connection is stable. So I'm just going to share the screen now. Um, just please confirm, Daniel, that that's OK. Yep, yes, I have we can see the, shit, see the screen, yep. Thank you, all right, perfect. So I'm just gonna um, stop my video. There we go. So good morning. It's a real pleasure, as I said, to be here talking about a topic that's really important to me. And that's about the management and use of tailings. Um, I just wanna acknowledge um, before I get going, all of the wonderful researchers who've contributed to this, um, to this work. So obviously I'm the group Esse leader. Trabalho. Claro, eu sou líder de um grupo de, de, de um grupo de colegas at the University of Tasmania. So this really builds on uh, many years of research where we've looked at rehabilitation options for various mine waste materials. And really what we're seeing is that there's this great opportunity to actually see these as actually products which could you know serve to to contribute to future supply chains, particularly in the space of construction materials and critical metals. So without further ado, I'm just going to jump straight in now. Um, but before I get going, you know, when we think about waste, you know, we don't necessarily think of something that's, you know, particularly glamorous or exciting. But I just want to say that if nothing else in the next 30 minutes, I want you to take away the fact that mine waste is quite simply the most fascinating and interesting place that you can actually work. So what I'm showing you here are three different types of mine waste. And these are probably the three that I spend most of my time looking at. So we have waste drop material here. We have um, slag materials here from the Rio Tinto mine in Spain. And in fact, the campaign I'm on right now is sampling materials just like this. And we also have mine tailings, which you're looking at here. And these are some mine tailings um, in Northeast Queensland. And you know what I want to really convey is that when we talk about waste, or certainly when we talk about mine waste, we always talk about it as if it's this homogenous material, but it really is anything, anything but homogenous. It's really heterogeneous, which means that characterizing the material thoroughly is absolutely fundamental to working out reuse options. So I'm showing you here some micro analytical results of some of the characterization work done on these materials. And you can see how varied that is. I mean, in terms of looking at, you know, the, the, um, the mineralogy of these mine waste materials, you can see we have a series of, of sulfides, all of which are going to behave very differently if we consider reprocessing. In this slag material, you can see certainly we've got lots of, um, you know, euhedral needles of olivines, and we have these kind of um, crystals of iron oxide sitting in here, but again, very hard material to consider reprocessing. And here we have, um, you know, essentially what looks like a, a pyrite uh, grain, which is actually weathered from the inside outwards, which is, is quite unusual. But what, what this means is, particularly in this case, is that we have to really understand the fundamental properties of, of the mineralogy of these sulfides. So in this particular case, if we characterize this and we knew that it was it contained a lot of micro inclusions or trace elements, we could then predict that this is this type of weathering pattern that it may produce under sufficient conditions. So really, you know, this is, it's the best place you can work. You know, this every site is different, amazing, challenging, and is full of opportunity. Now we don't have um, days and days to talk, which is a shame. So today we're just gonna talk about one of these waste types, which is um, mine tailings. And obviously um, there's been a lot of discussion over the past um, over the past few years about mine tailings and Daniel and his team here at the SMI have done a great job pulling together a lot of information, key fundamental information, really informing us of the scale of the problem of dealing with um, mine tailings. So um, essentially this, this great graphic that came out just, just a few months ago really captures the, the scale of the problem. So in terms of thinking about the total volume of tailings we produce, you know, we're looking at something that's, um, you know, height six kilometres, width six kilometres. And, you know, there was a statistic that came out in 2019, which said that globally we produce um, 100 billion tonnes of, of mine waste per, per annum. And if we compare that to some of the waste that's produced from other streams, such as e-waste and plastics and textiles and food waste, you know, mine waste far um, exceeds uh, the volumes that, that have been produced by these other streams. Yet, in many ways, in terms of... Um, 
the global desire or the, the public's desire to, to change and put pressure on governments in terms of how we manage mine waste, we see a bit of a slower response. But I guess that's that's something that's been changing in, um, in the past little while and I think is going to continue to change when we actually evaluate the amount of additional mine waste we're going to produce in coming years. So Daniel and his team have sort of done forward projections in terms of the amount of additional tailings we're going to be producing as we um, meet the global demand for metals moving forward and coupled with um, with an increase in population. So we certainly have a very, very big problem on our hands to, to manage, which we're all very much aware of. And, you know, one of the things that really um, challenges me in my day job and, and certainly worries me when I think about the future for my children is, you know, we're looking to move towards low carbon technologies, which I think is is great. But the upshot of it is that obviously we need more metals to, you know, support the development of things like EVs. So, you know, in terms of electric vehicles, countries like India say that, you know, they're going to go full EV by 2030. And I'm not 100% convinced that they're going to meet that target, but certainly there's going to be a big push towards meeting that target. And what that means is there's going to be an increased consumption of copper, which means there's going to be an increased production of mine tailings. So I guess, you know, to me, we can all see that where this is going. The problem is only going to get worse. So we need to do something differently in terms of how we're managing our mine waste materials. So we're not producing such vast quantities as has as been predicted. Now, an interesting conversation I had probably now three or four weeks ago with someone very senior in a major mining company was that she remarked that mine waste is where CO2 emissions were five years ago. So to me, that really means that right now we've got this great opportunity to get in front of the problem and actually start embedding different practices, you know, be that, you know, additional um, legislation, you know, regulators sort of mandating slightly different practices occurring when it comes to mine waste management. But really, you know, we've got to get a grip of a mine waste issue now before we see it escalate and, and really, you know, see ourselves in a tricky spot as we do right now with um, carbon dioxide emissions. So, you know, we've talked a lot about, you know, the volumes of tailings. So we're just going to quickly go through how um, tailings are traditionally managed. Um, many of you would have seen this, particularly after recent um, tailings um, disaster events. But certainly there's three main types of how tailings can be managed. There's the upstream construction when we talk about tailings dams. There's downstream and there's centerline construction. So essentially tailings, um, you know, they get put into dams and they can have these three different designs and these are the most common. So upstream, which is here, new lifts go over soft tailings. And for many companies, this is the most economic way to actually um, construct their dam. Um, downstream construction, new lifts go downstream, which means that you need more material to build these. But generally speaking, these are considered to be more geotechnically stable. And then the centerline construction, it's kind of a, I guess in many ways it's described as a, somewhat of a, a hybrid between both um, the upstream and the downstream types of dams. Another way in which you can store your mine tailings are in retention dams and I guess, and also impoundment types. So I'm showing you here some different examples of, um, of places where um, tailings have been placed into impoundments and sort of um, purpose-built facilities. Here you can see tailings being discharged directly into a pit and actually that's quite a common practice. Um, you know, they can be specially dug pits, they can be you know, beautifully constructed ring dikes, or they can be cross valley impoundments, um, which obviously comes with a lot of risks when you think about geotechnical stability. So these are kind of the, common, the most common ways in which we store our mine tailings. But obviously as we've seen from, from recent events, um, that can be somewhat of a challenge. So um, obviously, this graph here from Santa Marina et al. Um, a couple of years ago, it really shows, um, you know, the number of um, events that have occurred in terms of failures and the number of human lives that have been lost. And this certainly is not a happy graph. Um, you know, for me, perhaps the the, the main um, tailings down failure that I remember is probably the Mount Poli disaster. And this happened in 2014. And this was, you know, it's certainly in terms of footage, it was um, very dramatic. Um, you know, obviously, we saw that the, um, the the dam there had failed and it had impacted on the Quesnel Lake uh, up there in Canada, and it had a significant impact on the communities in terms of um, livelihood losses and etc. But we've seen far more devastating tailings dam failures uh, occurring in Brazil since uh, the Mount Poli disaster in in 2014. And certainly, to this particular audience, I, I don't need to to highlight the the things that happened there, but um, but certainly. These were big events in terms of changing uh, the global conversation around mine waste and tailings. So 
So what happened after Brumadinho was many, many different researchers, companies, organizations, they all got together and reviewed how exactly they um, approached tailings management, tailings research, and really um, led by Daniel and uh, Professor Anna Littleboy here at UQ, we, we endeavored to out on our own sort of global conversation on tailings, uh, which took place in 2019 um, before obviously the world changed. Um, and essentially what Daniel and Anna and the team undertook was a series of consultations around the world to really understand what we need to do as researchers to actually service um, you know, the, the mining industry in terms of changing the way that we are managing tailings, you know, what things do we need to bring to the table? Do we need to research different, um, you know, where, where are the research funds going now? And we also talked to a lot of our different colleagues um, across the world, and you can see some of them listed in this, uh, in this graphic here. So through the series of consultations and the questionnaires and the conversations with um, many different um, collaborators and, and organizations, um, we really sort of um, created a snapshot in terms of what the main problems are and how we could start to, to deal with those. And really what they, um, they indicated was that we need more education and training at a very fundamental level in terms of um, ensuring that we have tailings engineers who are fully qualified and you know when we're going to build those dams actually um, have a lot of um, you know, world-class knowledge, um, a global standard, as it were, in terms of understanding how to regulate, manage, construct, etc. cetera. Um, we also saw that in terms of research funding, a lot of money was already actually going into the geotechnical side of things, and perhaps a little less so into um, thinking about valorization of mine tailings or re uh, identifying reuse options for these mine waste materials. So for us, um, and for me in particular, that really, um, spoke to, to my core research and really made me think about how we could actually meet many different global challenges that we face uh, through the um, valorizing mine waste materials and, and perhaps meeting needs in other um, areas of our, our global challenges. But you know, in parallel, what was, what was occurring was um, the production of the global industry standard on tailings management. So you know, after the disasters that had happened, I thought it was absolutely fantastic to see the global community led by the ICMM, the, the UN and the PRI, really getting together and you know, talking to different stakeholders. You know, there was a series of consultations that occurred globally. You know, they had many experts appointed onto the panel, but really what they did was they, they had their own global conversation. They talked to the, the financiers, the researchers, the, the mining industry, you know, all the relevant stakeholders. And through that consultation period, they produced this new industry standard on tailings management, which I never actually thought I'd, I'd see, but I think it's absolutely fantastic that this was published last year and it comprises of six topic areas, 15 principles and 77 auditable requirements. And right now, you know, obviously I work um, very closely with um, the mining industry and MET stakeholders. I can see that, you know, they've taken this standard very seriously. And you know, they're, within their companies, they're looking at how best they can improve and integrate um, you know, the requirements that have been put out there. So it's really great to see that even in this short space of time, I mean, it's only been what, I think 10 or 11 months since it's been published, it's already had such an impact on current practices and certainly in terms of thinking about future design of, of new TSFs. So this, it's been great to see this change in the area of geotechnical risks. But really, when we think about mine tailings, it's not just geotechnical risks. I mean, certainly um, the tailings um, storage disasters and failures showed that, you know, in terms of geotechnical risk, yes, there's a big one. But there's also another significant risk associated with mine waste. And this is really my focus area. And that's the geochemical risks. So what you're looking at here is acid mine drainage or acid and metalliferous drainage, as we like to call it here in Australia. What that refers to is when sulfide minerals within these waste materials or within mine tailings or waste rock materials, when these sulfide minerals oxidize, they can produce acid and that acid can leach out into the environment. And the United Nation actually called acid and metalliferous drainage the sec second biggest environmental problem facing our world. So in terms of like environmental devastation um, and impacts of mine waste materials, this is really significant. And it certainly is one that we don't see a global standard like the, the tailing standard for, for, for TSF design actually um, exist in the same manner. So what we, you know, what we really do need to do is move towards um, some sort of global standard on acid mine drainage um, prediction and management, which, um, which is something that Carol Stein 
in the panel discussion a little bit later on, we'll, we'll update you on in terms of the guidelines that have been produced since in Tasmania. So that's kind of the motivation, but really the thing is, we could probably um, find alternative ways to manage our mine waste and break the source pathway receptor chain involved in producing acid mine drainage. If we actually looked at these mine waste materials differently, if we looked at them in a more circular fashion, we might be able to break that source pathway re uh, receptor chain. Now I'm showing you this, the Paris Climate Agreement, because for me, this was a real um, game changer in terms of you know, for someone who works in characterizing mine waste, this was a real game changer because what it was kind of um, encouraging people to do was to think about, you know, we need to we need to improve resilience to climate change and reduce greenhouse gas emissions through a technology framework. Now, the types of technologies that are required um, really to, to reduce greenhouse gases, these low carbon technologies, they require critical metals. And critical metals are actually um, very much concentrated in mine waste materials. So what I'm showing you here is Australia's critical mineral strategy. And every year in Australia, we put out a critical mineral strategy. But in these mine waste materials, we have abundant, you know, abundant critical metals absolutely required to meet those needs in terms of developing these new technologies to meet um, a lower carbon future. So there's an opportunity to break that source pathway receptor chain, to look at those sulfides and, and other minerals associated with them and actually extract these critical metals. So we could actually break that source pathway receptor chain and supplement metal needs through mine waste valorization. And that's just one particular option that we have with mine waste. And it's certainly been the option that I and my research team have been focusing on over the past uh, 18 months. So I mentioned this, this is the source pathway receptor pollutant linkage chain. And I guess traditionally when it comes to things like acid and metalliferous drainage management, we tend to focus more on the pathway and the receptor end of, of the chain rather than looking at the source. But surely the best way to manage acid and metalliferous drainage is not to leave material that is gonna oxidize. Why leave material under the conditions by which it's gonna actually oxidize? Why not do things differently and actually let's tackle breaking this chain at the source. And the circular economy has really empowered us to look at mine waste differently. I mean, certainly the Australian government, uh, uh, you know, a few years ago put through down the challenge. They wanted the circular economy to become a $26 billion industry by 2025. Now, Daniel's obviously uh, part of this, this discussion and maybe he'll be able to comment as to how close to that we're getting. Um, I'm not sure, I haven't, I haven't looked at the recent statistics. I think we're a way off though, um, is, is my, my gut feel looking at things that I've read. But certainly if we look at these mine waste materials in a much more different way, in a circular way, we might have an opportunity to increase um, the contribution from mine waste to Australia becoming, um, you know, growing its circular economy um, businesses. So we have a real opportunity here. So here's a map that I love, I show it very often. And I really love it because it really shows how if you start changing your perspective in how you view a material, you know, you can actually view maps like this in a very different way. So what you're looking at here is, you know, many years ago, there was an opportunity to map across Tasmania, the outcrops of acid forming materials on the surface. You will see that there's a concentration of these kind of red zones, and NAP means net acid producing potential. There's a concentration of these red zones um, concentrated uh, sort of in the west or northwest coast of Tasmania. And this is where our major ore deposits are in Tasmania. Now I'm not gonna talk about the geology of these ore deposits, but let's just say these are world-class ore deposits um, mined for many different commodities. But these, you know, if you look at this map in a very different way, this is actually a secondary prospectivity map when we think about looking and exploring in mine waste, because this is showing all the hotspots of where all the reactive materials are. So these must be all the materials containing all of those sulfides. And commonly, you know, a lot of the things that we're targeting are sulfide um, associated. So this really should be looked at as a secondary exploration map. And certainly many companies have been moving into Tasmania and looking at it in exactly this manner. So I've listed some of the companies here. I've listed some elements here. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna just gonna have a walk through um, some of the projects in Tasmania that I'm aware of, and certainly there may be others which, um, which Carol will talk to in the panel discussion. 
Um, and I'm going to share with you some of the highlights in terms of the opportunities that we have in the mine waste materials there. So I'm going to start with this one. I'm just going to flip back. This is um, the Rosebury mine here. And um, a couple of years ago, I had a, a, an honours student, Lexi, working on this site. So what you're looking at here is the Bobadil Tailings Storage Facility. Um, it was soon to be closing at the time. And, you know, they were thinking about opportunities for, or options they had for closing and eventually rehabilitating this tailing storage facility. So we've been undertaking several work programs focused on understanding the geometallurgical properties of the tailings. And by that, I mean, characterizing it and working out which metallurgical process would be appropriate to recover the metal of interest. Um, we'd been undertaking that at a couple of other sites, which I'll, I'll get to in a couple of slides. But we wanted to go back and have a look at this particular um, tailing storage facility because the um, Rosebury mine is a base metal mine. It's um, polymetallic and therefore there was an opportunity that contained within minerals such as sphalerite, which is a zinc sulfide. There could be other things associated like indium or gallium or germanium or these things which are commonly required for touchscreen technologies, um, and certainly sort of new, um, you know, um, machinery to do with um, uh, transportation and so forth. So we went back to the site um, and Lexi undertook a sampling campaign, which is what you're looking at here. She wasn't able to um, access the guts of this uh, tailing storage facility, but certainly she got a good um, snapshot of the upper two meters, um, the characteristics of those. I mean, she was limited um, in terms of her sampling equipment at the time of her campaign, but certainly it was enough to give us a good idea to look at the concentrations of zinc, of gold, of copper, and also of lead in these sediments that she collected. So what she found in the, in the sediments that she had collected was that there was actually um, an abundance of gold. So just in that upper two meters, um, there was significant gold contained within some of these materials. And she even reported some incidences of free gold being visible. Now, I guess the, the, um, the hypothesis is that, you know, as I said, she, she only sampled very much in the upper portion. You know, we, she started to penetrate into the sulfidic um, parts of the tailing storage facility, but certainly the majority of her samples were in that sort of interbedded oxide zone. But if she'd have penetrated deeper into there, I, you know, the, the hypothesis is that the gold grade would have increased um, significantly because older tailings obviously concentrate at the base of these tailing storage facilities. And as processing technologies change, obviously grade recovery changes, so, you know, the, the hypothesis is that if we'd have kept going, there may have been gold at the bottom of that TSF. Now, the opportunity is, you know, is now presented for us to go back to the site and um, to work with MMG and to actually consider characterizing materials at depth. You know, in other projects we've done, we've identified new um, technologies that will facilitate us accessing materials at depth. And when we think about the challenges that Rosebury are facing right now, um, they're currently actually in a bit of a crisis because they need to find an area to put a new tailings dam by 2024 to enable the continuation of their mining activities. So potentially an option could be to characterize these mine tailings, understand the tenor and the deportment of things like gold, and maybe also have a look at the, um, the um, content of indium, gallium and germanium in sphalerite materials at depth too, and work out if there's an opportunity to reprocess that material because if it's reprocessed it will potentially then create um, a, a, an area where these new mine tailings could, could be placed but it also could influence changes in the plant design itself too so there's there's a lot to be learned from going back and characterizing these more which may drive future changes and help the company work towards a solution to manage its um its challenge in terms of where to place these tailings materials now another site is um, the Grange Resources. This is the old tailings dam you're looking at here. This is the Savage River mine. It's an iron ore mine located to the north of the Rosebury mine that we were just talking about. Now, one of my former um, students and now postdocs, uh, Laura Jackson, for her honours research, she undertook a project here where we were looking at trying to find a solution to manage the old tailings dam. You can see that we have um, subaerial tailings for the most part in an area here which is um, subaqueous seasonally. Um, but the challenge here is that these are acid forming tailings. We have 38 million tons of pyritic tailings that were deposited from 1967 to 1982, and they're actively producing acid and metalliferous drainage. So the mining company and the state government of Tasmania have been working together through the SRRP 
um, to really come up with solutions to um, to minimise the AMD coming from the the old tailings dam, and to find new solutions to I guess improve. Um, well, just uh, new solutions to reduce and improve the environmental quality of this area. So our research or Laura's research was um, looking at opportunities to extend this water cover, because certainly if your tailings are water covered, it's kind of sealed off from allowing oxidation to occur. So whilst sulphide oxidation may still occur, it will occur at a much, much slower rate, depending on the, the, the thickness of that water cover. So we were looking at extending the water cover and, you know, we, we came up with a, a, a scheme, as it were, or, or a methodology or a proposition in terms of how and, and what depth was required um, to actually sort of prevent oxidation from happening at a significant rate. Um, but, you know, for various reasons, um, extending the water cover became impractical. So another thing that we did was we looked at the mineral chemistry of the pyrite materials contained within the tailing storage facility. And what we found was that actually it was very well endowed in cobalt. So in a series of projects after Laura's work, um, we undertook fire leaching trials to actually recover that cobalt from these mine materials. And, you know, certainly this is looking like a very prospective project indeed. So um, in terms of moving forward, you know, we developed a methodology by which um, to, to recover the cobalt. And we also considered repurposing opportunities for the future new mine tailings. So that's something um, else to, to factor in once you've recovered your critical metal of interest, what do you do with the new waste? And that really speaks to some of the research that Daniel and his team are doing. But certainly moving forward, um, in, even in fact next month, we're going to be going back to the site, we're going to be drilling a series of, of more resource definition holes at the site. So we've only been able to look at the, um, again, we've been a bit limited in the sampling equipment we've had thus far, but certainly for a first pass investigation, looking at the upper five metres is more than sufficient, but we'll be going back and drilling holes to, to the full depth, which is 60 metres, and actually characterising the cobalt tenor throughout the entire profile. And if we can actually, um, prove that there's significant cobalt even at depth too, and also refine our bioleaching methodology that we, we published a couple of years ago, then we have an opportunity to turn the fate around here and break that source pathway receptor pollutant linkage chain, prevent AMD from happening, and also make, um, make some, some money that will contribute towards that circular economy goal, which is certainly um, a big driver. Now, another site where we were also looking at cobalt was um, at the Mount Lyle mine here. So this is one of the most famous mines in Tasmania. It's one of the oldest and it was um, it was a, a copper, a copper gold mine back in the day. Um, it's currently under care and maintenance. But this student here, Jo Van Balen, she had an opportunity to, to do a similar study to the previous that I discussed. And we went out to this um, tailing storage facility and again, here we'd noted that there was a high abundance of cobalt in her mined materials. So we took a boat out, we went across, as you can see, during the boat there, we accessed samples underneath the water cover. So this is a bit different to the other sites in that all of these mine tailings, apart from this area here, are contained under a significant water cover. So this is not um, a site where we have um, AMD actively being produced. The tailings materials are actually quite stable. But when we looked at measuring the cobalt grade through assay, integrated assaying mineral chemistry mineralogy programs we could see that you know the cobalt was very well endowed here and so um, we had a student up at the University of Queensland working on bioleaching opportunities to recover that cobalt and that's work that's been ongoing now with um, collaborators for and southern um, over in the School of Earth and Environmental Sciences and so you know very simply Jo put this figure in her thesis and I'm just going to share it with you here because I mean it's very back of the envelope but it certainly speaks to the opportunity that we have here so you know, we've got 42.3 million tonnes of mine tailings and an average grade of 7.7% pyrite. You know, we can work out, you know, back of the envelope type thing, there could be a contained value of 190 million uh, US dollars. Now, the statistics are a little bit old now, I suppose. The price of cobalt has since gone up a little bit. But when we think about what this means for this mining community, this is really significant because as I um, mentioned um, the site's currently under care and maintenance. So the main mine site is um, located about five kilometers south of this uh, tailing storage facility. But after a series of, um, of fatalities that occurred at the mine site, um, it went into care and maintenance, I think in 2014. And I'm sure Carol will, will correct me if I'm wrong in the panel session. Um, but you know, this is a site where there was a mining town, um, mining community there relied on the mine for, for, for obviously for, for employment and other, other sort of various things. But it's been uncertain for many years now whether or not the mine's going to restart. Now, potentially, you know, looking at remining these mine tailings could be just the thing to kickstart operations back at the mine because, um, you know, Vedanta, who are the current operators, they've been looking to sell this mine for a number of years. And, you know, in the local or the local media, it's reported that, 
you know, the, the sale of the mine is being negotiated right now. But certainly, you know, if you could say to future investors that there's this opportunity, there's this potential cobalt mine sitting right there that could also be accessed as part of um, as part of the, the sale, then maybe this could change the fate around for the entire mine and really kickstart and breathe some new life back into this area and um, reinvigorate the local community that works down there. Now, perhaps the one flagship project that we have showing all of this actually happening is down at the Helio Gold Mine. So the Helio Gold Mine, um, I'm just gonna mute that slightly. It's located to the north of the sites that we've just been discussing, but this is actually a place where mine or mine tailings reprocessing is a real project. Okay, I'm just gonna stop talking and let you watch the video for a sec, just to show you that actually remining tailings is a, a significant valuable business pro proposition. So you can see they've made it a profitable business. And actually since, um, since they um, commissioned or started um, activities at the, uh, the Helia mine, they've also actually moved to other parts of Tasmania, this company, NQ Minerals, and they're actually currently evaluating the Beaconsfield resource and, and kickstarting life back into that project. So there are real opportunities to actually undertake um, mine waste processing um, in Tasmania, as you can see, which is great. So, but the other sites that I've described or previously described in, in the previous slides, there's an opportunity to get these online to this type of standard. So, you know, even in a place like Tasmania, um, there's real opportunities in the waste materials down there. Now, I'm gonna change state now. So anyone who's, um, who's not too hot on their Australian geography, Tasmania's down here and Queensland's up here. So. Um, working now with the Sustainable Minerals Institute, a lot of my focus has been looking at th that type of mentality, thinking about the valorization of waste for metal recovery in many different areas. And already in, in Queensland, there are two significant active projects at the Century Mine, where they're remining the tailings to extract zinc, and also at the Mount Carbine Mine, which is in the northeast of Queensland, where they're looking at remining tailings to extract tungsten, which is considered a critical metal. Now, my team and I, we've had the opportunity through state government funding to go to a number of different sites. Um, we've got funding until 2024. And really what the state government has seen is that there's real value in characterizing these waste materials, much in the, the same vein that I've been describing the other projects that have been touched upon in Tasmania and the Century Mine and, and obviously um, uh, Mount Carbine. So what you can see on this map here are some of the sites that we've already targeted. And it's been a range of heat leach materials, which you can see here, mine tailings, um, and also, you know, weird and wacky things like phosphor gypsum waste from phosphate production. And, you know, certainly um, it's been a very busy uh, couple of years so far. And we also have funding to continue this research to look at um, at least um, 18 more sites in the state. So that's great. Tendo mais 16 uh, localidades sendo estudadas, todos esses projetos são financiados pelo governo. E aqui está a característica principal dos depósitos, de, de acordo com as cores da legenda. Então, você, se você voltar para aquela outra uh, mapa e conciliar com as informações geológicas, você vê o que é mais interessante para cada localidade. Eu não vou ter tempo para falar de todos os trabalhos que nós estamos desenvolvendo nesses lugares, mas vamos querer de, deixar disponível em outros websites. But, you know, in terms of our main targets, we've certainly been looking very heavily at cobalt, indium, tungsten, and um, rare earth elements. And I just wanted to share this with you now, because this is the project that I'm working on here today. So I'm at the Mount Morgan mine, which is in, um, I guess it's just, uh, just adjacent to uh, the city of Rockhampton in Queensland. And, you know, what they've done at, at this particular site, you know, Mount Morgan was once one of Australia's most important mines. I've been told that it was, um, you know, one of the most significant open cut mines. It paid the national debt several times, the national debt several times over. 
um, when they were undertaking gold extraction and copper too and, um, and silver. Um, but what they've got here is a viable project in terms of reprocessing the tailings and extracting gold. But they're actually, I guess what's changed the fortune of this project, so a few different operators over the years have, have attempted to reprocess the tailings and certainly there was a company recently that was taking a crack at this site but they have looked at new technologies or new opportunities to um, reprocess the materials, which is sort of sets them apart from things that have done previously. So they've developed something called the resin technology where they kind of recycle the cyanide that they use in the processing in, in a very sort of um, bespoke manner. So this is something they have a patent on. So in terms of circulating what, what that recipe is, I don't think I'm able to do that, but certainly it's an example of people looking at the value in waste and you know the guys on site they're working really hard to get the project up and running and um, they're just about to build their processing plant but some of the other waste materials they've got on site and I think you can just about make it out in the background here are slag materials and these slag materials they've got many millions of tons of slag and they've got 90 million tons of waste drop also to deal with they potentially could contain value too so we've done some initial test work looking at the slag and you know that is gold bearing but to actually crack that gold out of that slag will be a very difficult thing to do so when we think about mine waste and its valorization we have to think about adapting our mineral processing technologies so they are appropriate to deal with materials that are partially oxidized or partially weathered and some of these mineral processing technologies are shown here so one of uh, one of our postdocs working in the my watch team and whitworth she undertook a recent review looking at new technologies appropriate for critical metal recovery from mine waste material. And there's a whole heap of things shown on this slide. I'm certainly not going to talk about all of them, but if you're interested in learning more about them, we certainly have that um, report prepared and, and submitted to the government and that will be made available shortly on, the, um, on their portal. But Anne's also in the process of writing a series of, of papers which speak to all of these new technologies. But in order for us to really you know get the most value out of these technologies it requires collaboration so i mean um, as geologists which both Anne and i are um we've had to spend a lot of time working with our mineral processing colleagues and colleagues of chemical engineering and other groups within the smi to really understand how we all fit together in this puzzle of reprocessing and it's been a very fruitful collaboration but i just want to emphasize that the only way we're going to crack this problem of and seize this opportunity for tailings reprocessing is by working in collaboration with other experts now, I've talked a lot about um, critical metal recovery from sulfides, but certainly there's many opportunities to valorize non-sulfide gang too, which um, this slide from my colleague Glenn Corder really speaks to. So, you know, in terms of all the different waste types we have, you know, there's opportunities for strategic metal recovery, which we've talked about, but, you know, things that don't contain sulfides or non-reactive or, you know, don't sort of give um, elevated signatures of metals in leach tests, they can be used for a whole heap of different things, including construction materials, agricultural inputs, reductants, et cetera. There's a lot of different opportunities for tailings, but we have to just start asking the right questions in terms of, you know, we've characterized this material. So that's a, a correct question to ask. We have to understand those characteristics because they're so heterogeneous, we can't make assumptions. And then we need to find the right, um, I guess, um, product line by which we can actually start making a useful material from the mine waste itself to reduce the volumes that we're producing. And so I guess one of the final slides I've got here is an example of that currently in action. And this is a slide from, from Daniel Franks, and I'm sure he can talk to this in the panel discussion in a bit more detail, but certainly he's had funding um, from the um, United Nations Environmental Agency to identify solutions to the, to the global sand crisis. And so the Vale Mining Company is trialing production of construction sand from iron ore materials um, and these iron ores are, are tailings um, from its mine site in Menas Juras. I'm sorry, I haven't pronounced that properly. But, you know, certainly this is another example of collaboration. So, you know, Daniel has a couple of different groups here. So the, the Federal University um, actually in Brazil and also the, Uni the University of Geneva working together in collaboration with the SMI to actually look at if we can meet this crisis that we have in terms of construction sand by actually valorizing mine tailings from the iron ore um, productions occurring in Brazil. So that's a massive opportunity to really reduce volumes. And that's a really significant piece of research in terms of valorization, which does not in in involve critical metal recovery. So um, key implications. On this final slide, I just want to go through a few things that I think are really important in terms of seeing us change the way that we manage or think about mine waste. So I think I've spoke to this, um, probably not as elegantly as I'd like, but I've spoken to this thing about systems thinking. So, you know, previously, before now, 
in terms of my career in mind waste it's very much been thinking in isolation so i've got this one problem i've got i've really got to you know stop acid and metalliferous drainage but really the conversation around the chemical risks of mine waste materials changed when things like um you know the united nations declared it a major risk or you know to meet the needs for our critical metals um future demand these things have really you know driven changes so if we think of acid and metalliferous drainage management as part of a, a bigger piece you know we could use you know if we think about these mine waste materials differently then we've got the opportunity to meet you know future housing crises i mean what you're looking at here is 3d um, printed houses using clays and we know that mine tailings contain can contain a lot of clay minerals so maybe there's an opportunity to 3d print houses using clays recovered from mine tailings which also meets the needs that we have in terms of um, future housing because we know we have a, a growing population so what are we going to do to make affordable housing and that's one particular opportunity that we have there you know mine tailings play a role in in greenhouse gas emissions through you know valorization of tailings to help facilitate the development of those new technologies. I think there has to be significant cultural change. I mean, Daniel and the team, when they were going around having the discussions as part of the Tailings Consortium, you know, it was very much stated by every major mining company and everyone in between that, you know, producing the next generation of Tailings engineers or Tailings or mine waste practitioners was absolutely fundamental to seeing improvements, lasting improvements being made into the future. And really we have to start talking to our kids you know, young people um, that, you know, the waste streams that they need to think about are not just plastics, it's not just e-waste. Mine waste is probably the, the one that they really need to think hardest about because that can have some of the most devastating effects as we've seen um, from both the geotechnical and the chemical risks that AMD can pose. We have to design for closure. And this is something that people at CRC Time and many people have been saying, even in mining companies, which is great to hear um, for a little while now. So, I mean, when we're thinking about starting a new mining operation we have to have that design plan correctly planned in advance and i know that obviously plans are made but better plans need to be made because that will pre prevent any amd seepage that will mitigate any of these geotechnical and geochemical risks we have to embrace opportunities to innovate and this is one that i've seen very slow to happen so you know new technologies are coming online in terms of characterizing geological materials you know we can look at 3d mineralogy and textures now using you know micro ct and, and tomography and tools like that but they don't yet feature so heavily in the mine waste area so we really do have to take that we have to we as researchers need to develop um protocols and pathways by which these technologies are accessible to the industry but we also have to give industry the confidence to go beyond just sticking to i guess the rules and the guidelines that were set out many many years ago so for instance, in the field of acid and metalliferous drainage, you know, commonly we use um, an approach that was developed in the 1970s. The tests that were developed then are the ones that we still use today and are regulated or, or required by regulators to see. So I'm talking about NAP-NAG type tests. And, you know, now seeing the technology that we have online, we need to actually be seeing some of those new technologies featuring in the guidelines in terms of how we undertake characterization. And I'm sure Carol will talk about that because she's really done a fantastic job in terms of leading, um, I guess, the way in Australia in terms of getting these innovative technologies into good practice guidelines. And I'll let Carol talk about that in a little while. And, you know, fundamentally, we saw something great happen with the global tailing standard being produced. But, you know, it's not just the geotechnical risks we need to think about. We need to have some sort of global standard in terms of AMD management too. And maybe that will be requiring materials to be looked at and thoroughly characterized to identify reuse options, because there are many, many potential options available and so I, I put this this final piece here you know the g7 summit was a couple of weeks ago now it feels like a lifetime ago it's you know the news is obviously rapidly changing but certainly one important statement that was made and you know i know they're politicians um and obviously they 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 have big goals but they really said that they wanted to conserve or protect at least 30 percent of our land and oceans by 2030 and to me that really speaks to um needing to improve the way that we're mining our uh, well we're managing our mine waste materials and we do need to really seriously as a global community be pulling together even harder to find different opportunities for managing these materials and i hope i've shown i've shown you that there are opportunities for valorization and we just need to embrace those opportunities because they could be very fruitful in terms of contributing to the circular economy 
and breathing life back into communities um, which so desperately need it in the case of, of those examples I showed you in Western Tasmania. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, apologies if that's gone slightly over time, but um, yeah, just thank you very much. And I'd like to acknowledge these people again and uh, happy to hand back over to you now, Daniel, thanks. Thanks, Anita. Very interesting presentation. Uh, lots and lots of case study examples. So hopefully that'll um, trigger the interest of our audience. We're now gonna move to our panel session. I'll ask our panelists to, to all put on their videos and, um, and to join us. Um, our panel today, we have four, or four renowned experts from Brazil and Australia who I'll introduce in a moment. We're gonna be taking questions in the Q&A function during the main, remainder of the webinar. So I've seen some have come through, we've already got four or five through. Um, now our panelists are gonna answer those questions um, as we go along. Um, and so if there's any of our panelists that wanna answer those questions, please do. Um, we'll take as many questions as possible, uh, as possible, bearing in mind that there's a large number of attendees joining us today, a very healthy audience. So thanks for joining us. Um, I'm now gonna introduce our panelists. Uh, our first panelist from Brazil is Mr. Paolo Mishk. Um, Paolo is the CEO of Lago Resources, which is a Canadian enterprise operating in Brazil um, through the Lago Venedio de Maracas, uh, a Vanadian producer. Paolo has had 36 years of experience in the mining industry. He's uh, worked with a number of companies, MBR, the AMG Group, Magnista and Anglo-America. Um, Magna Cita, sorry, an Anglo-American. Um, he's a graduate of the Federal University of Minas Gerais in um, mining engineering, and he has an MBA from Ohio University. Our second panelist from Brazil is uh, Mr. Marcio Remedio. Marcio um, is director of the uh, mineral, of the geology and mineral resources section of the Geological Survey of Brazil. Um, he's been a head of the SGB CPRM um, parliamentary advisory. He's a coordinator of a team responsible for uh, divestment of mining assets. Um, and he graduated in geology from the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, he has a master's degree in science from uh, the Sao, Sao Carlos uh, School of Engineering um, as well at the University of Sao Paulo. And our final panelist, um, in addition to uh, our guest speaker, Dr. Nita um, Pavaka Fox, is Ms. Carol Stain. Carol is a rehabilitation project officer um, at Mineral Resources Tasmania in the Department of State Growth. She's been working in the mining sector for over 15 years, background in environmental science and experience managing and treating acid um, rock drainage. Um, she's currently working at, um, her current work at Mineral Resources Tasmania involves developing and managing acid and mellifluous drainage. Um, and she's developed a good practice guidance on that. Um, she's also assisting with the Mining Sector Innovation Initiative Program. Um, I'll now, so that, that's our excellent panelists for today. I'm now gonna start with Paolo and um, Paolo Mishk, CEO of Lago Resources and ask him if he could share with us some examples of the reuse of tailings that, they, um, that he's been involved with and how these projects have contributed to the company's strategic plan. Paolo. I'm now gonna to move to our next panelist, who's um, Mr. Marcio Remedio. Um, he's the Director of Geology and Mineral Resources at the Geological Survey in Brazil. Um, and Marcio, I wanted to um, talk to you about um, the situation in Brazil. Brazil has taken leadership on the issue of tellings, mine tellings reuse in recent years. Um, Vali, as um, Anita mentioned, has started co-production of stand, sand and construction materials as a way to um, manage tailing storage challenges. Um, Nexa Resources has been looking at um, soil amendments for agriculture. Um, could I ask how the Brazilian government, or maybe more specifically the geological survey, is uh, taking action on tailings reuse? Obrigado pela pergunta. Boa, bom dia e boa noite a Thank todos. Thank you so much for your question. Good morning and good, good evening to everyone. 
Well, the Geological Survey of Brazil has been developing and working on two fronts. One that's focused on the reuse of tailings for the agro-mineral industry. We have research projects and also the, the mapping of agro-minerals throughout the country. And in this project, we characterize and survey different mineral sources to be used in remineralization re techniques. Or we also have focus on soils and also stockpiles, mining stockpiles. In accordance with the specifications that we have in the Ministry of Agriculture in the country. Another front that we have been working on to meet the growing demand for strategic metal is through a project in partnership with the Geological Survey of Brazil in partnership with the Federal Survey of Mineral Resources of Germany. And we also have the participation of the Mineral Center in Brazil and Anglo America Brazil. We try to use the cobalt used in different deposits. And the objective of the project is to define mineralogical characteristics that will allow us to process cobalt through bio, bio leaching. So the objective of the project is to create a biohydrometallurgic project to recover cobalt and also copper, vanadium, and others based on characteristics that are found in different rocks. The processing aims to have more economic efficiency and lower operational risks. And for the future, we, we want to use indium, germanium, manganese, and other minerals as well. We want to develop this technology, technology preferably for the use of reuse of tailings. So these are the two fronts that we have been working on and the geological survey as a science and technology institution of the mining and energy industry has been focusing on these areas. So I'll, I'll pass the floor back to you now. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I have a, a follow-up question then. Um, there's there's a, a good amount of potential for the use of mining waste in agriculture. Um, are there any legal instruments for the use of mining waste in agriculture in Brazil? Yes, this is, this is an important question. Well, since 2013, there's been a, an amendment in our pesticide law in Brazil, including remineral, remineralizers. So rock powder, for example, can be used as a category of agricultural input in Brazil. So this has enabled us to use new technologies, new pesticide technologies. This has become more consolidated through ordinances that were created by the ministry, establishing parameters for the use of these products. And in Brazil, we are generating a lot of disposal materials that are being used for civil construction as well. And this is now an opportunity for us to start using also these these materials in agriculture, and this is according to our legal, in accordance with our new legal instruments these days. Thanks, Marcio. Now we have um, about 15 minutes left in our um, session with you this morning. I'm um, going to return to Marcio if we have some time to ask some additional questions, but um, Paolo, I wonder if you're back online and whether we can um, try or retry your internet connection. Um, and are you there, Paolo? Hi, Daniel. Are you trying to? I'm still trying, by the way. Uh, Great. Let's let's try you... again. So I think that uh, the question I was asking you was about uh, you know your experience of re reuse projects um, of tailings. And you're, you're on mute there, Paolo.
Uh, Daniel, is it, is it better right now? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, I will, I will try uh, the way it is now. Uh, so I, I, I'm just gonna say some uh, two case studies, which uh, we have the tailings we cover to produce different minerals. The first one is the, in the AMG operation in Brazil, uh, the operation recovered uh, tantalum, niobium, and tin, and from the pegmatite. And pegmatite is basically 50% uh, feldspar, 30% quartz, 13% spodumin, and the balance is mica and other stuff. And at that time, the result of this, this operation was you know, a small profit, uh, and it was challenged to face the, 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 the total volatility price. So we, we decided to go to the, the tailings to recover the, the feldspar and, and lithium mainly, both. So a huge uh, research has been developed in Brazil and also in Canada. Lakefield Research Center. And we, we got a project by flotation, you know, uh, separate those minerals. But just to, to give how difficult sometimes it is to, for those uh, projects to succeed, we, uh, the, the, the board decided that it's uh, too risky because the salars in, in Chile and, and, and Bolivia you can get much cheaper lithium uh, production. So they didn't approve it. But I, I was still uh, trying to get a uh, different revenue stream and also to you know, get a better usage for our tanks. And we, we developed with a very small capex, uh, these spodumin and feldspar to supply um, you know, porcelanate and also glasses. So we start using those minerals, just removing some, some uh, iron mica uh, and supplying those uh, uh, markets. And it has been working that way for 18 years. In 2018, the AMG uh, implemented uh, a flotation that was designed basically 20 years ago. So today they, they, they have spent 800 million uh, reais to produce the spodumin concentrate, and they are planning to produce the, the lithium uh, uh, hydroxide. Just to have a sense, they, they, they start with 90,000 tons of the lithium concentrate and they expect to, to double this production. So it's, it, it was a very good example that how to recover uh, some mineral from, from tailings. Uh, at Largo, it's a um, Canadian company, as you said, and we produce vanadium. We, we are the leader of the primary producer of vanadium in the world. We have the, the best high purity quality, one of the lowest cost. So it's a very successful operation in Brazil. Um, but despite of this, this uh, you know, all this good performance, we, we are developing uh, the, the, the recovery titanium from our tanks. And we have, we, we have done a, a huge research, you know, trying magnetic separation, trying uh, rhythmatic methods as well. But the, the final one was flotation, you know, to recover the humanite. We have already approved the implementation of a, uh, a, a plant to produce 150,000 tons of humanite. And in the future, we will, produce the titanium pigment, you know, aggregating more value to this titanium. And we, 
we expect to produce. It's just a expect because we didn't issue the technical report yet. Uh, about 120,000 tons of TiO2 as pigment. It's basically the amount of the, to the total amount of TiO2 pigment that Brazil imports. It's about two thirds of our needs. So it's not just, okay, get a, a good usage for the, the tailings, you know, get a, uh, some revenue from it, but it's uh, to have a co-product that will allow us to have another revenue stream as important as the native. And to be more specific, it's, uh, I think the most important is to get out of your comfort zone. Because if you are just, you know, in a comfort zone, producing your main product, you know, getting your, your uh, results, uh, it's more, much more comfortable. However, it's not the right things to do. I think we need to be focused mm -hmm. to get the better, better results for the environmental, better results for, for get a, a good users for the minerals, uh, minimizing the, 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 the environmental impact and generating more value for the communities that we are located. Okay. So I think that's Thank the you. main issue regarding this. Thank you, Paolo. Um, I, there, a colleague of mine once said, uh, um, being a miner should be more like being a butcher in the sense that a butcher doesn't only produce rump steak or fillet steak, they also make sausages. So we need to treat all bodies like that. They have all of these different um, uh, potentials that we can um, make uh, and, and take the, the, the whole all body uh, perspective rather than just trying to take the best out of it and leaving the rest behind. Okay, I'm now gonna move uh, across to Carol, um, who's working in the Tasmanian government and has been involved in producing this guidance on um, acid and mineraliferous drainage. Um, I wanted to ask you, Carol, um, about the challenges of kind of sustainable closure when you've got these um, uh, tailings facilities like upstream tailings facilities that are sophitic or that have this potential to produce acid for drainage. Thank you. Um, yeah, in Tasmania, we do have um, a couple of issues. I guess one is we've got quite a few mines with a very long mine history. So we're talking like 50 to 100 years. So we actually haven't had a, a significant mine close in Tasmania. Um, the majority of our mines do have upstream lifts and they do obviously provide a significant closure challenge, both from a geotechnical perspective and I guess um, a, an environmental perspective as well. And the, the government floated the idea of a good practice guide for acid and metalliferous drainage for a couple of reasons, um, the main one being that the current literature, particularly um, the Guard Guide, which is obviously a very robust document, um, and this, the Australian guidance on acid and met metalliferous drainage is just very complicated. And we have also a number of smaller operations who um, don't even know they exist, I guess, for, for one thing, and also providing to, to provide guidance from the regulator on the, the expectation. Um, that might be need to be set. Um, from a tailings perspective and how that fits into the tailings, I guess one of the spaces is that we need to work harder on, especially in Tasmania, is characterising the waste before we commence mining because we've had quite a number of operations in Tasmania that have started mining and have had this huge issue with downstream water quality and acid mine drainage and, and haven't been able to achieve a profitable operation and, and had to close with quite a significant environmental um, legacy. Um, and, and as Anita pointed out, MMG on the West Coast is currently having this issue where their mine might, might not be able to continue, although it's prospective because of um, not being able to fit their tailings into a tailing storage facility. So being able to reprocess tailings um, from a regulator's perspective is, is good in a number of ways because we're getting rid of current legacies with upstream lifts. Um, so we don't have acidic water reporting to the environment um, and we um, aren't having to go through and, and um, impact more land as well that um, would, would have otherwise been left as forest, I guess. So um, 
yeah, I think that probably sums up, I guess, the answer to your question. Um, yeah. Well, thank you very much, Carol. Thank you to all of our panellists uh, for the excellent contributions today. Uh, it's been a really great uh, conversation. Um, I would, would now reach the close of, of the webinar. Um, before we do end, I'd like to express my thanks to Under Secretary um, uh, Lilia San, Santagostino um, and Professor Plint for their support. Um, thanks to Anita, Carol, Paolo and Marcio for their participation on the panel. Um, also, big thanks to uh, Mr. Andrew Edge, the Deputy Ch Chief of Mission at the Australian Embassy in Brazil, and um, Caio um, Yacon, uh, also of the Australian Embassy, um, as well as Paul Rogers from SMI, Jill, Ivers, and the rest of the communications team for their support. Uh, thanks all to our, also to our interpreters who've made this exchange possible. If you've got any feedback or questions related to aspects of the webinar, please feel free to contact me through the SMI webpage. My details are there. Um, we very much look forward to welcoming you to the third and final webinar uh, in our series, which will be held in August. Um, an invitation will be sent out in coming weeks. Thanks for your attention. Have a very good rest of the day or evening. Keep safe um, and uh, um, we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot. <laughs>